Hey you guys, back once again for another Tomes of Terror book review. And as I mentioned in my last review, I'm actually going to try and do some more newer stuff, you know, stuff that came out in the last few years that was available to read on Kindle Unlimited because I've sort of gone through most of the print books that I had wanted to cover. And as I said, you know, until I can afford to buy another pile of print books, because I do actually prefer reading print books, um, I'm going to take advantage of my Kindle Unlimited subscription and uh, read some stuff on there that was kind of highly rated. Again, I know I said on my last one too that I was gonna try and do um, kind of winter themed horror for the month of December, but then I realized when I started reading this one that I was just kind of like, oh wait, this isn't really <laughs> winter themed. But I had been wanting to read this one just because this one actually came out in summer of 2019, but I just remember a lot of hype about this one and a lot of horror channels covering it. From the synopsis, it sounded actually really good. So I was just kind of like, well, okay, I know it's not like winter related, but it is available to read for free if you have Kindle Unlimited. And so I decided I was going to dive right into it. Plus it was very, very highly rated on Goodreads. And it was like four and a half, four and three quarter stars or something. I mean, there were a couple of one and two star reviews, but not really very many. Most people really, really seem to dig this. And honestly, um, I can see why. Now, I will say that this is not, it's, not as much a horror. It's scary, but it's more of like a thriller than a horror. It's kind of like a serial killer type situation, like child abduction type thing. Um, and it's not real gory or graphic, but it really is good at, it just has like a really compelling story to it. It has like a really good characterization um you know the the characters you really feel for them and you kind of like get in their heads so even though it's not like over the top horror in the sense that you know it's not like monsters or anything really it's more like a thriller but it's still like really creepy and it has like some really creepy elements to it i also like that it has sort of i guess what you would call like a paranormal element but it's left ambiguous as to whether it's actually a paranormal element or not. And I kind of liked that ambiguity of it. It's not real overwhelming, but in some of the stuff later on could have been explained by rational means, but maybe not, like maybe not necessarily. So I like that it kind of left the door open for that. So this book is called The Whisper Man. And the author's name is Alex North. Now, Alex North is apparently a pseudonym. Uh, the author is, he's from uh, England, he's from Leeds, and he's apparently written books under another name. But interestingly, if you look up Alex North, like the Alex North author page on Amazon, it just says he's published books under another name, but doesn't tell you what that name is. <laughs> so it's like, I guess this is a situation, because I know a lot of writers do this, where it's like, if you're kind of known for writing something in one genre and then you want to try out a different genre then you just write under a pseudonym and you don't really want the two things to cross over so i get that so i don't really know what alex north's real name is or what genre he normally writes in this is actually his first crime thriller i think he's written one more since then and it's pretty fucking great i gotta say this was another one that because i liked the last book that i read so much uh, autumn bleeds into winter and even though I was like, well, I'm getting so ahead on my book reviews just because I've been wanting to read more lately than watch movies, I guess. It just kind of goes back and forth. So I was like, well, I need to do some more movie reviews and watch those. But it's like, man, I really want to read another book. I was kind of all invigorated <laughs> by like the last one I read. And I had already checked this one out because I already had all the December ones checked out in my library. And I was like, what the hell? It's, you know, it's it's Thanksgiving. I'm just kind of sitting around doing nothing <laughs> other than digesting food. And I just just kind of felt like you know sitting around and reading something and uh honestly i finished a good this isn't and it's not a terribly short book i think it's 350 pages something like that um i finished 75 percent of this book in one sitting like while i was just sitting around on thanksgiving day <laughs> like it was, i'm doing this even though i was actually reading it on my computer because it's an ebook but you know this is another book that just really sucked me in from the first page and just didn't let up. And it was one of those ones that it just kept going and going and just, just all these twists and turns and all this stuff going on, all this mystery and all this creepy shit. And it was just kind of like, it was just really, really good. I enjoyed this one a lot. Uh, so yeah, I did end up uh, reading the last quarter of it 
you know, the the day after Thanksgiving and, you know, then wanted to do a review of it, like, as soon as possible. Now, apparently, I heard that, e like, either as soon as this book came out or even a little bit before the book came out, uh, the movie rights had been purchased by the Russo brothers, like the, you know, the guys that did the, do all the Marvel movies. I think they directed Avengers Infinity War and a couple of other ones. Uh, but I, as of, I think the last news I heard of that was either late 2019 or early 2020. So I don't know what's going to happen with that. To me, this would probably make a good movie, but I kind of feel like it needs a series because there's a couple, there's two or three different like intertwining threads in this. And I sort of feel like it maybe needs maybe like a mini series, you know what I mean? Like maybe four episodes or six episodes or something like that. So you can kind of like let the characters breathe a little bit because I do think that the characters are the best part of this. Now, the only thing that, and this is not a criticism, but this is just something that, that kind of like threw me off at first, but then I got used to it. The book starts out in first person uh, from the point of view of Tom Kennedy, uh, who's one of the main protagonists, which I'll get into in a bit. His part is in first person. All the other parts are in third person. So, so it does kind of switch from first person to third person, depending on whose perspective we're seeing it from. So it's, I don't know if that's going to bother you or somebody. It, it just didn't bother me. It was just, I was just kind of like, oh, we're in first person. Oh, we're in third person now. And now we're in first person again. So it was just that kind of thing. So you just kind of have to get used to it switching back and forth because it does follow a bunch of different characters. But the only character that is told from the first person is the character of Tom Kennedy, who starts uh, the book, like the kind of prologue part where he's ostensibly like writing to his son, you know, and then we kind of like unfold what happens. So as I said, because this is a new book, I don't really want to, well, newish, uh, 2019. I don't really want to spoil anything about it, uh, especially because, you know, if they do a series or a movie eventually, you know, you kind of want to, and this one, this one is one that actually does have a lot of twists and turns and revelations in it that are best left unspoiled because sometimes like when you read, I was just kind of like, whoa, holy shit. You know what I mean? It was that kind of thing. Oh, and I wanted to say too, that I love this. There's uh, even in the ebook, there's, they, they always do this kind of book club thing. If, if it's a book club pick, they always have like discussion questions in the back. And then they had an interview with the author. And he said that one of the ideas, like he was telling about where he got the idea from this book from. And there was a couple different stories that he told, all of which were pretty cool. But the one that was like really creepy was that he was, he said, I was watching my son one day, uh, who I think was eight at the time. And he's like, and I kind of heard him talking to somebody like out in the living room, like he's out there playing. And uh, he's like, and I knew nobody else was there. So I thought that was a little weird. So he goes out and he kind of watches the kid and the kid's like talking to nobody. And he says, you know, hey, bud, who are you talking to? And the kid says, the boy in the floor. <laughs> At which point I'd have been like, ha ha. But you know what I mean? It's that kind of well, kids say the creepiest shit kind of thing. But that's one of the things that um, that he said, like, inspired him to write this, because that actually does happen in this book. All right. So what we have, Tom Kennedy, as I said, he's the one that's uh, in first person. Now, he uh, has a son named Jake, who's seven. I think he's seven. Yeah. And um, they have just lost, he has just lost his wife, Rebecca, like in a very sudden way. Like she wasn't, you know, she was just like sick one day that she died. And so, you know, because they're fairly young. So they're kind of dealing with the trauma of that. It's been a while, like it's been a year. And they decide, um, they've been having some, pr not so much problems, but I think the reason that some of this resonates so much is because, uh, you know, Tom's character is since it's from the first person he's talking about his feelings about how you know how he's left to raise this little boy alone and the little boy jake is one of those kids he's very very quiet he's very precocious he's very creative he's not real uh socially adept and he mostly just likes to stay by himself and draw and Tom kind of implies that he was sort of like that as a kid too, although he doesn't really remember it all that well because he had kind of a shitty childhood. And so he's having a hard time relating to the kid, especially now that uh, his wife is gone because he felt like his wife and his son had a much better, like a much easier, more organic uh, relationship that he's having a really difficult time replicating. So he's having a really hard time relating to his son and he's really kind of heartbroken about this. Like he feels like he's sort of failing him. 
So he decides that the best thing for them to do uh, would be to move out of the house uh, where there were so many memories because Jake also found his mother dead uh, and still has really like a lot of trauma and nightmares about it because it was such a horrible experience. So he thinks, well, maybe if we just get out of this house, then, you know, everything we can kind of like pick up and start over again. So they move to this little town called Featherbank. Now, interestingly, the house that they move into, it's kind of old. And uh, this is actually, it's set in the UK, but it's not super like UK centric. I didn't even realize, like other than a couple turns of phrase, uh, I didn't even realize that it was that it was the UK, so it's not real noticeable, I guess. I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, but I'm just saying it's not super noticeable. This could kind of be anywhere, like any kind of small town uh, place. So, uh, so he moves to this place, and the house that they get, it's like this kind of weird looking house that I guess back in the old days, all the kids thought was like the scary house, just because it was kind of funny looking, like nothing... Nothing necessarily bad happened there, like no murders or anything, but it just it's just funny looking and it gave people like a funny feeling. However, Jake saw it when they were looking through houses online and he insisted that that was the house that they had to have and he just would not have it any other way. So, you know, he's so Tom's trying to make his son happy. So he's like, OK, well, that's the house that we'll have. So they move in there. Now, it turns out that in this town of Featherbank, 20 years ago, um, five little boys were abducted and murdered. Now, four of the bodies were found. One of them was not. So the person that did this was a serial killer who the media dubbed the Whisper Man because one of the things that he would do was he would kind of come up to the kids' windows at night and, like, whisper to them, like, to lure them out. Now, uh, interestingly, this serial killer was caught. Uh, his name was Frank Carter, and he was put in prison by uh, a detective inspector, uh, Pete Willis, I think his name is, who is kind of like, he's still kind of on the force, but he seems like he's semi-retired. Um, but he still has an obsession about the one little boy that wasn't found. Like he knows that the little boy is probably dead, but the fact that he was never able to completely close the case, even though he did catch the killer and put him in prison where he still is to this day, um, just that one kid still being missing, like not knowing where his body is really haunts him. So he kind of goes and visits the serial killer every now and then hoping like to get some information out of him. And it's kind of like, cause I've seen this book sort of compared to Silence of the Lambs. It does have a couple minor similarities in the sense that yes there is a detective character who visits a serial killer to see if he can find out where the last body is and there is also a, like kind of a slight thing to do with like kind of a butterfly moth kind of thing but it's very minor so it is a little silence of the lambsy but not really you know what i'm saying or, or at least not any more than any other crime thriller i guess you know what i mean i don't know and honestly the the aspect of the detective still going back and talking to this serial killer it's not like a main part of the story because this like i said this story has a lot of like intertwining threads a lot of them having to do with the relationships between fathers and sons you know traumatic childhoods and if you're sort of if you can not replicate them like when you get older and have your own son you know alcoholism abuse and stuff like that when kids are younger and then you trying to struggle to not be like that anymore so you have that detective character. Now in the present day, after Tom and Jake have moved to this house in Featherbank, another little boy in the town goes missing. Like it's right before they move there. And the MO of it seems not exactly the same, but very, very similar to the shit that happened with the Whisper Man case 20 years ago. Now, obviously it's not the same guy because that guy is in prison and they got that guy like dead to rights. Like the bodies were in his house and everything. And uh, so they know that he did it. But uh, even 20 years ago, there were some kind of rumors swirling around that maybe he had an accomplice and so maybe this accomplice is still running around and after 20 years has decided that they want to, you know, pick up the mantle or whatever, or perhaps this is a copycat of some kind. So basically you're kind of going back and forth between the investigation into uh, this little boy, Neil Spencer, who gets uh, abducted and try they're trying to find him 
And then, um, you know, the detective going back and like talking to uh, the the Whisper Man and trying to get information out of him, and then the the shit that's going on with uh, with Tom Kennedy and Jake, his son. Now there does seem to be, like I said, there does seem to be some kind of paranormally shit going on because Jake, um, who, like I said, is a very kind of sensitive child, it's. It's left ambiguous whether he actually does have psychic powers or can see ghosts or whatever, but he's starting to have like imaginary friends in the sense that, well, he has this one imaginary friend who's a little girl who nobody else can see but him, obviously. So, so she comes to him and talks to him about things and, you know, seems to be sort of a comforting presence. But then when they move to the new house, um, you know, there's kind of more a scary one, like, you know, the boy in the floor and that kind of stuff. And then there also seems to be like weird human shit going on where it's like one night Jake uh, goes downstairs almost like he's sleepwalking. It's like he's going to unlock the door and it seems like there's a dude like outside, like trying to get in the house, like sticking his fingers through the mail slot and whispering and stuff like that. And also there's this dude who was like trying to get into their garage, which had a padlock on it and acted kind of sketchy. So you so there's kind of all this weird, all these things like swirling around this investigation and about this missing boy. So it's kind of going back and forth between the relationship between Tom and Jake, Jake acting kind of weird, like acting out and like saying all kind of weird things that imply that he has, that he knows something about maybe what's going on. And also you're following the investigation, Pete Willis from the original investigation, he's like in his fifties now, but there, there's also another detective uh, named Amanda, Amanda Beck. And um, she's doing this current case, but she's kind of working in cahoots with the older guy, like, because he worked the original case. So they're trying to find this one boy that got abducted before, you know, he gets murdered and all this other stuff. And they're trying to link it with the old case. And that's pretty much how it goes. So as I said, I liked this book a great deal. Like I said, it's pretty much, it just draws you right in from the very beginning and it just doesn't really let up. It's just, there's always just kind of like twists and turns and uh, all kind of different things going on. And I really liked, after I got used to it switching back and forth from first to third person, it didn't really like, you know, like I said, it, it was jarring at first, you know, for the first chapter or two, but then I was like, all right. And then I kind of got into the rhythm of it and it jumps back and forth from, you know, the first person, which is Tom Kennedy. Uh, sometimes it's from Jake's point of view. Sometimes it's from Amanda Beck's point of view. Sometimes it's from Pete Willis's point of view. So it jumps back and forth uh, between all these different characters, but it never gets muddled or confusing. Um, you always know kind of who it is. It's a, I, I don't want to say it's like, it's not a straightforward story necessarily because it's kind of complex and there's a lot of moving parts, but he has a really good uh, sense of control over it. So it doesn't really go meandering off or anything. It stays very focused. Uh, so even though it's going back and forth between different POVs, um, you still always have that thread going on. It doesn't really like jump back and back and forth in time too much or anything like that. It always just kind of like jumps around to different characters and keeps moving forward. And so in that sense, once you start reading it, it's really, really hard to put down because you're just kind of like, what the fuck is going on? Because there's just like creepy shit, creepy shit, creepy shit. And it's just all going on all over the place. And there's always kind of like a sense of danger too, because you know, this kid got kidnapped or, you know, is, are the cops going to find him before he gets murdered? And then like, you know, other things happen later on. And, uh, so it's just, it's a really great story. I mean, like I said, it's not, if you read a lot of thrillers, um, you know, a lot of people have said it was kind of similar to Silence of the Lambs and it's not exactly, it's not really like that. There's a couple of very like minor similarities, but other than that, I didn't find it all that much like Silence of the Lambs. But like I said, you know, the thriller genre, you're going to get a lot of overlap in these kind of like serial killer type of stories. So obviously, you know, there's going to be similarities in that regard, but honestly, this was just a really enjoyable uh, read and it's and it's actually pretty creepy and it's like pretty scary and you know so if that sounds like something you would like like I said there's it's kind of about child abductions and child murders it's not real graphic um, it doesn't linger on you know descriptions of what happens to the kids it keeps that pretty subtle it's kind of more concerned with the characters the relationships you know the father son dynamic and sort of how the past impacts the present. So it's more focused on that. It's more focused on the atmosphere, the dread, 
things like that more than being like a police procedural that's kind of concerned about uh, forensics. But yeah, if that sounds like something you would like, this was actually a really, really good one. If you have Kindle Unlimited, you can read it on there for free, and I would definitely recommend it. It was, you know, a great read, a real page turner. And if you like creepy thrillers, then this should be right up your alley. And as I said, um, we'll see if they make it into a movie or a series or something like that. If they do, um, I'm totally going to watch it because it seems like it would be really good. But yeah, that'll do it for this Tomes of Terror, and I will see you guys on the next one. Bye!